Assalamu alaikum and hello. This is the first in a series of educational videos on the history of Islam in Britain that I hope to produce sporadically from my primary research. Today's video concerns Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam and how new research has brought to light different aspects of how his religious work intertwined with his legal civic activism and political work in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century. Previous scholarship indicated that Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam was either a revolutionary socialist because of his civic activism and work with trade unionism and his legal representation of working class people, or that he was a liberal aligned with the Liberal Party in terms of values and in things like his membership and advocacy of the temperance movement, as well as uh, his opposition to the death penalty. However, the research that I've undertaken in the last two years indicate that um, the primary sources indicate that in the 1880s, he was an active member of the Conservative Party in Liverpool. Um, and, uh, uh, and even after he stopped being active in the mid 1880s, he, he continued to have a close association with local Tory politicians, um, in particularly with regard to his trade union activity. I want to end with a uh, brief reflection on the subtitle of this presentation, Tory and trade unionist. Today, Tory and trade unionist seem like, seems like an oxymoronic or contradictory um, set of ideas given our recent experience of Tory opposition to uh, radical trade unionism uh, uh, over, over many decades and the, um, and the way in which um, uh, trade unionism has been legally curtailed under successive conservative uh, governments. However, to quote L.P. Hartley, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. It is clear that what I'm going to mean by Tory and trade unionist both had very different meanings in late 19th century Liverpool. So I'm going to unpack that. All I request you uh, to do is to listen with an open mind and not to, uh, not, not to um, impose current or modern understandings of these terms onto the past. But before we get into all of that, did you know that Liverpool FC and Islam go back 120 years? It's not just all about Mo Salah, the scoring sensation who's been celebrated on the cop and the fans chant that um, if he scores another goal, then they'd want to be Muslim too and they want to be in the mosque with him. Of course, Mo Salah is well known to pray at Penny Lane Mosque um, and um, and he's the um, you know a big star in the eyes of a lot of Muslim youth, and he's credited with helping to bring uh, the Muslim communities of Liverpool together more closely with um, Merseyside as a whole, uh, and having a kind of a, a positive effect on on community relations. But um, I'm going to reveal in this video that in fact the relationship between Liverpool FC goes back to the founding of the club um, and the relationship that it that the founder of the club John Holding had with our very own Abdullah Quilliam. So what new research is being covered in this video? Firstly I'll look at Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam's friendship and work with John Holding, the founder of Liverpool Football Club and the first Lord Mayor of the city uh, in 1897. Secondly, I'll look at Quilliam's early political activism with the Conservatives in Liverpool in the early 1880s before he converted to Islam. Thirdly, I'll look at his career as a legal advocate for the poor of Liverpool and as a, as a trade union leader focusing on his 18 years serving the Carters Union. And finally, I look at the significant role that Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam's son, Bilal Quilliam, played uh, 
in the 1911 Liverpool General Transport Strike. So first of all, let's kick off with the story of an unlikely friendship between Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam and John Holding, the founder of Liverpool FC. When I started this research, my initial starting point was the historic visit of the Lord Mayor of Liverpool to the Liverpool Muslim Institute in an official capacity to the Eid al-Fitr celebrations in 1898. This picture here, it doesn't directly relate to that, the festivities of that, um, of that event in 1898. However, it does give a little bit of an idea of what the uh, Muslim community in Liverpool looked like. So it was a combination of converts, around about 200 or so, uh, that built up over time from small numbers, uh, from mostly from a working class origin. Um, but intermingled was a kind of cosmopolitan or polyglot community, um, which included Indian ulama uh, who were hired to act as imams at the institute, particularly in the 1890s um, and later on, but also an itinerant group um, of Muslim uh, sailors who'd be employed uh, from Bengal, from Somalia land, um, and other places, um, and they would um, often be left on Liverpool's docks at the end of their time in employment uh, and left without work. And they would come in and out of the mosque community, um, swelling its numbers at times, and then going off again uh, when they found work elsewhere. Um, so they came from all over the Muslim world and played an important role in spreading news of the Liverpool Muslims uh, amongst the maritime routes that went down the co west coast of Africa, down to the Cape, uh, through the Suez Canal and through the Indian Oceanic trade, um, all the way uh, to uh, Bengal and further afield to Australia and so on. So here we see uh, in this picture that um, the Liverpool Muslim community uh, showed its affiliation to the Ottoman Caliph. We see the men here, uh, many of them wearing the um, Ottoman tarbush um, and, ho and holding aloft the flag uh, of the Ottomans uh, with, its, with the crescent on a red background. Um, and, uh, and so um, some of the description of the celebrations in 18, 1898 indicate that when the Lord Mayor arrived, uh, he was greeted by the community outside the mosque um, and uh, they were then um, along the West Derby Road, uh, along Brown Terrace, there was um, a display of the, uh, of the boys regiment that was set up uh, along the lines of um, drilling regiments from the um, Ottoman army. Uh, and the, the 30 members of this would have included orphans from the orphanage that the Institute ran, as well as some of the young uh, men uh, in the community, the teenagers and so on. And apparently the Lord Mayor was very much um, taken with this uh, display. And we should point out that, you know, what marks out this visit of 1898 is that it is an, an historic first visit by a senior city official to a, to a mosque in Britain, um, the first that we know of. Um, and therefore it, it is a mile, historic milestone in the history of Islam in Britain. Um, and this was certainly recognized at the time. The Crescent described it as a triumph for Islam and John Holding, as the uh, Lord Mayor of Liverpool, uh, when he addressed the, the Liverpool Muslims, he spoke of the importance of including them in civic recognition alongside the Jews of Liverpool and all the other Christian churches. So for John Holding, he did not want to um, conduct his Lord Mayorship uh, in a sectarian way, 
uh, but wanted to recognize all the different denominations, Christian and non-Christian, within the city and recognize them as part of the city. So we could describe this as a kind of um, precursor to modern civic multiculturalism that attempts to have the same kind of official recognition from civic authorities and officials. So who was John Holding? Well, he's best known today for his key role in establishing professional football in Liverpool. From 1882 until 92, John Holding presided over Everton Football Club, winning the league championship with them in 1890-91. But following a dispute which saw Everton Football Club leave Anfield, in 1892 he founded Liverpool Football Club in order to make use of the empty ground. He went on to oversee the club winning its first championship in 1901. But besides his key role in establishing professional football in the city for which he is now best remembered, he had many other strings to his bow, like Abdullah Quilliam. He came from a poor rural background working originally as a shepherd as a young lad, but went to Liverpool to make his fortune and did well as a self-made businessman in the drinks trade, eventually owning a brewery and a string of 10 pubs. He was a long-time philanthropist who worked with the West Derby Union. The union built and ran workhouses, hospitals, and other amenities for the poor in the east of the city including the famous Alder Hay Hospital. John Holding served twice as the West Derby Union's chairman. For all these works for the poor, he was affectionately known as King John. He was also very active politically. He was Tory alderman, or that, that is an older word for councillor, from 1884 for the Everton and Kirkdale Ward where he lived and worked, rising to become Lord Mayor of the city in 1897. Finally, he was a prominent trade unionist and was the first president of the Carters Union from 1889 until 1897, when he had to step down once he took up his political role as Lord Mayor of the city. So were John Holding and Abdullah Quilliam compatible, or were they chalk and cheese? Here's John Holding, some 20 years senior to Abdullah Quilliam. On the question of drink, they certainly were chalk and cheese. As mentioned earlier, John Holding made his money from the drinks trade. He owned a brewery and a string of 10 pubs throughout the city. Quilliam, on the other hand, was famed as a temperance campaigner. Uh, from the early age of six, he was, no, he was a noted speaker um, campaigning against the demon drink. So on this issue, at least, the, the, they were on opposite sides of the argument. However, despite that, they had a friendship going back to the 1870s. John Holding alluded to this long friendship in, in 1898 when he came to the mosque uh, to officiate uh, over its Eid al-Fitr celebrations as Lord Mayor of the city and, and referred to this old friendship and said that it had had its share of ups and downs. As we shall see, Holding and Quilliam worked closely together in legal, political and civic matters most notably, they worked together with the Carter's Union, Holding as its first president and Quilliam as its first solicitor. Both were noted for their philanthropy, especially giving dinners for the poor. And finally, and strangely, in fact, they were institutional neighbours of a sort. So the West Derby Union and the Liverpool Muslim Institute were both on Brown Terrace, um, at one point occupying the whole of either side of the whole terrace. 
Um, and so it, I think it would have been somewhat of a comfort for Quilliam and his fledgling community from 1889 when they first moved into Brown Terrace that they had a friendly neighbour at least. In the early years, there were quite a few attempts uh, at harassing and um, and even attempting to injure members of the fledgling Muslim community uh, in Brown Terrace. So again, I think having a, a neighbour of this sort would have been a source of comfort for them. It's really not very well known at all that there's a connection between Liverpool Football Club and the Caliphate, the Caliphate being the premier political institution in the history of Islam. Um, at the time of Liverpool's founding, this caliphate was situated in the Ottoman Empire and it was the last major institutional expression of the caliphate uh, which came to an end in 1924. So how did this connection come about? Well the founder of Liverpool FC, John Holding, went out on a tour to the east in 1896 with a party of Liverpool gentlemen. And Quilliam, as Sheikh al-Islam of the British Isles, arranged for Holding and this party of Liverpool gentlemen to be formally introduced to the Ottoman court, where they were received by Turkish officials. On the instructions of the Caliph, Abdul Hamid II, Quilliam's chief religious patron, Holding was awarded the Order of the Imtiaz, which you can see pictured here on this slide. On the back of the Order of the MTRs presented to John Holding, an inscription was written, translated as follows. This order was founded in 1800 of the Hijra of the Prophet. This decoration is for those who are sincere and courageous on behalf of the Ottoman Empire. We have granted it to Alderman John Holding of Liverpool, this day, 18th day of Dhul Hijjah, 1313, answering to the 1st of May, 1896. Now let's move on to Quilliam's role as a Tory activist, the peak of his activity being between 1880 and 1883. But first of all, let's set some background context about what was called Tory populism in Liverpool in the late 19th century. In a working class town, it is a bit of a mystery as to why Labour emerged late in Liverpool politically compared to other port cities or industrial cities in Britain at the time. So in Liverpool's case, the first Labour MP was only elected in 1929 and council control for Labour was only achieved in 1955. So the question is, given a strong working class population, why was this the case? And the answer was a populist Tory movement called Tory democracy in Liverpool and parts of Lancashire that mobilised Protestant working class support through playing the sectarian card and promoting some progressive policies such as public housing and expansion of the electoral franchise in the city to working class men. So in Liverpool, the working class vote was split between Tory Protestants and Catholic Irish nationalists. On the latter, we could see that Parliament's only Irish nationalist, T.P. O'Connor, was elected from Liverpool and there were more than a dozen councillors who represented Irish nationalist sentiment in the city. So this division between Protestants and Catholics was achieved by mobilising the Irish question. Obviously in this period in the late 19th century, Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom and was yet to achieve independence as it did in 1922. So at this point, the question of Irish independence was an unsolved political question and a contentious one 
in a city with a large immigrant Irish population from both north and southern parts of Ireland. So while the working class vote in Liverpool remained split on sectarian lines between Protestants and Catholics, socialism and the trade union movement in Liverpool remained weak and subordinate to this split. So trade unionism, such as it was in the city, had to avoid some of these contentious political and religious issues in order to be able to develop, to survive and grow. I want to speak briefly here about the two main architects of this form of conservative populism in Liverpool, known as Tory democracy. Two figures whom I want to introduce here are firstly Sir Arthur Forward on the left. He was a pioneer of Tory democracy uh, across the country. And this idea was met with a great deal of suspicion from Tory HQ in London. They viewed it as dangerous, as too left leaning, too keen to try and capture working class votes, which they regarded as a dangerous and possibly futile exercise. So Forward had a lot of um, scepticism to deal with nationally. Uh, it was a forward thinking man and a, sh a ship owner in the city uh, and was supported um, very much by John Holding and Abdullah Quilliam uh, in the 1880s as he was beginning to make his mark uh, in politics. Um, he did eventually become MP in the 1890s but died fairly young in, in 1898. The second figure on the right is Sir Archibald Selvage, who, who really did bu build the political machine that, that mobilised working class Protestant votes in the city through the Conservative Working Men's Association that he ran. And he did so successfully for decades and was the real power behind the throne of Tory democracy in Liverpool. Lloyd George, uh, who would become Liberal Prime Minister during the First World War, referred to Selvage as Britain's closest equivalent to a Tammany boss. That meant, meant a sort of big boss figure who would leverage working class support for favours and kickbacks um, uh, amongst the Irish diaspora in New York. So let's get to the heart of the matter and talk about Quilliam's involvement with this form of conservative populism or Tory democracy. As we can see this really the heart of it took place in the first half of the 1880s um, before he became Muslim but there is um, plenty of evidence that he continued uh, his political connections in other civic activism and trade union work that he did later on. So firstly, unsurprisingly, given his connection to the temperance movement, Quilliam joins the small Liverpool Conservative Temperance Association in 1880. Of course, the liberals in the city had dominated this agenda um, and they often criticised the conservatives for being uh, in cahoots with the drinks trade. Uh, and therefore, they were open to charges of hypocrisy on this issue. Um, but nonetheless, this was the s small and marginal conduit through which um, Quilliam became involved with Tory politics in Liverpool. From there, he moves on in the 18, early 1880s to become actively involved in running the Conservative Party in Liverpool. Firstly, as a council member for the Conservative Liverpool Association, and secondly, as an assistant secretary of the Liverpool Constitutional Association, which often arranged very big political and social events in the summer uh, to attract um, you know, large numbers of people to hear political speeches and, and hear entertainments, um, you know, sporting entertainments, races and, and the like. Um, and so he, with Hold, John Holding, organised a number of these in the early 1880s. So 
Quilliam stood unsuccessfully for the Tory candidacy for the Pitt Street Ward in the municipal elections of 1882. With John Holding, he did back Arthur Forward, who we mentioned earlier, to replace Lord Sandon as MP for Liverpool on his retirement. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, his active involvement in the Conservative Party ends in 1884. Quilliam having fallen ill and being advised by his doctors to travel, travel to southern Spain, to Gibraltar, uh, and then decides to go across the uh, Straits to Morocco, where he has his first exposure to Islam. So while he was um, getting interested in that and turning away from active political involvement in Liverpool, his his, his elder mentor, John Holding, was elected as Tory councillor for the Everton and Kirkdale Ward and served as councillor for many years uh, um, and descending in, the, uh, in politics in the city. Now that we've covered Quilliam's political involvement in the city's politics, now let's look at his role as a trade unionist and we're going to look at the years 1890 to 1908. Quilliam was essentially working as a legal advocate for the poor and so after he qualified as a solicitor in 1878 over the years he eventually built one of the largest practices in the north handling 70 cases a week the Liverpool Courier described Quilliam as the unofficial Attorney General of the city of Liverpool. So, as I said, much of his legal work focused on protecting the rights of the city's poor. And in the course of this work, over time, he represented several unions in the city, like the journeyman bakers, the upholsterers, the brickmakers and the coppersmiths. But his most important trade union association was with the Carters Union. John Holding, the, the Tory alderman, was its first president from 1889, and Quilliam was its first solicitor from 1890. Going through the local press, you can see reports about his legal work for the Carters. So he represented its members in matters such as unfair dismissal claims, personal injury claims and the determination of inquests for 18 years. So who were the Carters? We can see here a picture from the time with, um, with, with all the ships lined up on the docks and we can see in the picture thousands of men unloading these ships painstakingly carrying things off the gangplanks and loading them up onto carts pulled by horses. Um, these were the carters and they would take the, take the goods to the warehouses or to, directly to the railways for them to be shipped all around the country. Liverpool was the second port of empire after London. A great deal of the goods trade uh, pass through Liverpool from the empire uh, to the rest to, to, to the industrial heartlands of the north in particular. And so over this period, trade in goods grew from 4.4 million in 1858 uh, and uh, quadru quadru more than quadrupled to 19 million by the start of the First World War. It's also important to note that um, until the early 20th century, all passenger shipping uh, came from the empire through to um, Liverpool rather than Southampton. So if you, if you were traveling from Lagos to Britain or from New York to Britain, you wouldn't go to Southampton, you would go to Liverpool. So these were huge docks at their height, seven miles long, with thousands of carters moving these goods, as I said, to warehouses and quite distant railways. So in their day-to-day -day work, 
The carters worked closely with the dockers who would be unloading the goods onto the carts. And this continued really uh, until the run up to the First World War when motor lorries started to appear for the first time and began to challenge the monopoly of the horse-drawn cart. So what was it like to work as a carter? We see two of them hard at work pictured here, with the horses pulling absolutely massive loads. So the carters and the horses worked long and undefined hours of up to 15 hours a day or more. They had to care for their own horses at their own expense. When they got home from these very long days, going back and forth to the docks, they had to take up, up to an hour to groom their horses uh, and to take care of them and make them ready for the next day. There was particular concern about very young teenage carters and their exploitation by unscrupulous shipping companies. There was an anti-union sentiment too amongst the business class who ran the city's transport firms. There was general work insecurity for the carters, uh, which was one of the th things that drove their unionization. And the work itself was difficult and dangerous. There were many accidents and injuries on the job. In fact, many of the cases that Abdullah Quilliam um, took representing the carters had to deal with um, the accidents and injuries and sometimes fatalities on the job. So let's say a bit about the carters union itself. Its official title was the Mersey Key and Railway Carters Union. It was established in December 1889 with 3,000 members. Here's a picture of the carters in their Sunday best on a Sunday morning in 1897, the year that Abdullah Quilliam took over as the carters' second president. Behind them is their banner. We'll see a better picture of it in, the mo in a moment. So at its peak, the Carters Union became the fourth largest transport union in the UK. Even though it was an important regional haulage union, it remained very independently minded and steered clear of amalgamation with the Transport and General Workers Union until 1947, resisting advances to do so from the 1920s onwards. Finally, in its early years, the Carters Union was Protestant dominated, and this reflected bias in employment as the transport firms of, were part of the city's Protestant ascendancy. Let's say a little bit more about the Carters Union's political positioning and the type of trade unionism that it had advocated in its first few decades of existence. Here's a better picture, by the way, of its banner with its slogan, Unity is Strength. So the union's early, early leadership did not support the use of strikes. Obviously, its first president, um, John Holding, was a Tory politician and Abdullah Quilliam, somebody he'd known for decades, he appointed as its first legal advocate. As, a, as evidence of this, in 1890, the Carters voted not to support the Docker strike, although 500 Carters did break ranks. Instead of striking, the Carters Union aligned itself with the Tory preference for conciliation boards. So this was an indirect form of negotiation. The unions would send a representative, usually a solicitor, and the, the, the business, the, the ship owners and the transport unions would send their representatives and they would negotiate a deal 
if you like, at, at second hand on behalf of the two parties. Notably, the Carters Union was the only Liverpool union in the 1890s to put an arbitration clause into its rules. In other words, they made arbitration binding on, on members of the union. So it's unsurprising that they worked hard to establish their own Cartoners Board of um, Conciliation in 1891. And Quilliam, as the union's legal advocate, would arbitrate on the members' behalf at the board. On top of working through the conciliation boards, the Carters Union had a close alliance with popular conservatism in the city. The early leadership of the union, which included John Holding and Abdullah Quilliam, disparaged socialism and extreme measures like strikes. They wanted a close relationship with the, with the owners of the transport businesses. And they've, but the problem with this was that this process of conciliation only really led to limited reforms. And this meant that over the first few decades, many long-standing problems were left unaddressed by the conciliation boards. That said, it was well run and able to deal with most everyday legal claims and injuries, sickness and funeral expenses of its Carter members. And as such, the work of Holding and Quilliam was recognised by the doyen of the Labour Party and of socialism in Britain, the Fabians. The Carters Union supported the Conservatives in both municipal and parliamentary elections over the Independent Party, Labour Party and the Liberals. Uh, to give three examples that I found, um, they supported John Holding in 1894, their president, uh, Rutherford, in 1903, the local Tory MP, and Ketby Fletcher, uh, another local Tory councillor in 1906. He also happened to be a cousin of Quilliam's wife. On top of that, the Carters Board of Trustees had a strong conservative presence. As we already have said, John Holding was its first president until 1897, a Tory councillor and then a Tory Lord Mayor of the city, after which Quilliam was its second president until 1908. Besides this, Quilliam's board of trustees included Rutherford, the local Tory MP, and two further Tory councillors. On taking over as president in 1897, Abdullah Quilliam promised to carry on John Holding's approach and disparage the use of strikes. In 1900, with unrest amongst the railway carters, Quilliam continued to support the union's cautious support of conciliation with business and, and supporting Tory populism. Let's move on now to talk about the Liverpool Muslim Institute and the relationship of its members to trade unionism. Firstly, as the research of Dr. Jamie Gillam has shown, the Institute's membership was predominantly working class and makeup. Two of its members were senior trade union officials, for Shiuddin Peacock, who was secretary of the Tramway Employers Union, and Talim Wahbi George, committee member of the Amalgamated Union of Railway Servants. Wahbi George went on to arbitrate in the Taft Valley Rail Dispute of 1901. Peacock got his union to endorse Quilliam's unsuccessful run as an independent in the 1900 municipal elections. This appears to have been a bit of an afterthought on Quilliam's part because he only threw together the campaign uh, in the last 10 days in the run-up to the elections um, and was not unable to make much of a dent coming last in, in, in that particular election. Liverpool Muslim Institute members like Rashid Hodgkinson 
and Nora Dean Stephen gave speeches uh, that were critical of radical socialism, strikes and union combination in the years 1907 and 1908. I have to speculate here a little bit and suggest that trade unionism not having been addressed directly in such a way by the Institute leads me to believe that there were perhaps stirrings of support for unionism that were getting stronger uh, uh, amongst the membership of the Institute. And this is why um, uh, sort of uh, um, an approach that maintained the line held by Abdullah Quilliam was promulgated at the Institute in these particular years. And these were the last years, of course, of the Institute's running. So Hodgkinson and Stephen reiterate Quilliam's position. They support conciliation over strikes. They emphasize the mutuality of labor and capital rather than a conflictual model. And this was all combined with a sort of romantic longing for John Ruskin's true mutuality, self-reliance, the old guilds and the dignity of labor. And it's notable that um, people like Rashid Hodgkinson in his speeches talks about his rural upbringing and about the importance of craft guilds um, and and so in a way as a trans uh, these were transitional figures who were perhaps uh, cons conservative uh, and with a small c and were uh, uh, perhaps generically suspicious of radical socialist organizing and trade unionism in Britain. By way of contrast, let us go on to talk about Bilal Quilliam. Bilal was um, Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam's second son. And I want to talk about a, 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 an unknown chapter of the family's history, which was Bilal's uh, heavily, heavy involvement in the Liverpool General Transport Strike of 1911. And this marked a turn in the city towards socialist trade unionism and away from the conservative business unionism that I've been describing previously in this talk. So let me say a little bit about Quilliam's second son, William Henry Bilal Quilliam, who lived between 1885 and 1954. This is the only picture I could find of him from the time in which he was involved with, with radical trade unionism in Liverpool. This picture here dates from 1911, the year of the strike. When Abdullah Quilliam left with his oldest son, Robert, um, for his, Robert Ahmed, for Istanbul in 1908, Bilal was appointed by his father to deputise as Imam in Abdullah Quilliam's absence. However, he quickly sold off Brown Terrace, leaving the Liverpool Muslims with neither a leader, nor an institute, nor a mosque. Bilal had qualified as a solicitor in 1907 and uh, had, had, had taken his articles under his father's mentorship, and then continued his father's practice, Quilliam and Son, until 1922. But Bilal was to prove to be a disappointment. He fell into a life of crime, and was twice convicted for fraud after the First World War, and was struck off the rolls as a solicitor in 1937. This is a rather ignominious narrative but to it can be added one moment of integrity and courage on Bilal's part, which has been largely forgotten. So Bilal did continue his father's work with the Carters as their solicitor and as their vice president, but unlike his father, moved towards revolutionary socialism. So let me set a little bit of background about the Liverpool General Transport Strike of 1911 and the changed circumstances of trade unionism in the run-up to the First World War. Here we see, in fact, in this photograph, uh, trade union officials um, addressing 
um, the, the strikers in the in the strike of 1911. So in, in, in the run up to the First World War, there was increasing industrial unrest across the whole of the country. Um, and there was a surge in trade union membership. It went from 2.5 million in 1909 to 4 million in 1914. So this was a time when unions were growing in power. The tran general transport strike in Liverpool of 1911 was the largest strike in the city's history. Uh, 66,000 striked for three months and the second port of empire was brought to a complete standstill in that period. And there was remarkable unity shown amongst the strikers across Protestant and Catholic lines. And this is particularly remarkable given that two years earlier, the city had witnessed its worst sectarian violence, stoked by the likes, uh, by preachers of the likes of George Wise, for instance. So coming together in 1911, the Protestant Carters played a key role in supporting the Catholic Dockers. The strike could not have gone ahead without the support of the Carters. I don't think the Dockers would have been able to have done it on their own. But how did this come about? Because relations between the two had historically been frosty. So how did the Protestant Carters and the Catholic Dockers find this newfound unity? Well, here's an extraordinary photograph of the strike committee from, from 1911, the expanded one, uh, which ran the strike for three months in the city. Uh, you can see Bilal here at the back, uh, uh, along with two other MQRCU officials who joined him as part of the committee. And in the centre here is Tom Mann, the famous socialist organiser and syndicalist who came up from London especially uh, to, to run the strike. Now given that um, all these different trade union officials from different unions had come together, um, wisely they, they understood that they needed to forbid any political or religious advocacy uh, during the running of the strike so as not to exacerbate uh, any sectarian tensions in, uh, amongst striking workers. The truth is, is that the Carters and the Dockers knew that they needed each other for this strike to succeed. The strike came to a head in the infamous Bloody Sunday, the 13th of August 1911. Here is another amazing picture uh, of that day. And you can see uh, in the background the monumental St George's Hall. And the whole square in front of it is absolutely full of strikers who'd come to rally uh, for their cause peaceably. And as we've been saying, this strike crossed sectarian lines. So the Dockers and Carters marched from different from diff from orange and green parts of the city together and congregated here outside of St George's Hall. Bilal Quilliam spoke second to this huge crowd after Tom Mann. And Bilal spoke about the importance of maintaining calm discipline, especially given that they would most likely face provocation from the police and even provocation from the military, which had also been drafted in in large numbers uh, to, to uh, contain the strike. However, the day descended into a shocking instance of police brutality. Here we have um, a cartoon uh, published in the striker's own magazine, The Transport Worker. Here we see the sort of grimace on the face of the police officer, the strikers lying flat out on the road and a truncheon dripping with their blood. As other 
Carter's union officials were speaking, the police launched a savage attack on peaceful workers. Bilal jumped off the platform uh, in, Saint, uh, in front of St. George's Hall and, and went straight to the heart of the trouble with, uh, in Lime Street to urge calm and to keep the crowd out of the range of unprovoked police attacks. The police charges continued on those helping the injured. Discipline broke down and hundreds were injured by the police. The strikers achieved a real but partial victory. Here we see a picture of the pin of the Carters Union and this was used to identify um, official members of the union and it was to prevent um, people who weren't members passing themselves off um, as official members of the union uh, working, uh, working on the docks and in the warehouses and, in, and on the railways. So as I said, despite police violence, the strikers got their way on low pay, on draconian work conditions and on work insecurity. Bilal Quillian went on to play a leading role in advocating for the Carters on expansion of their union, on the need for peaceful picketing and for direct negotiation, abandoning the conciliation boards that his father had pioneered and had advocated for his whole career as a trade unionist. The union grew by 2,000 members that year and Irish Catholics joined too, en ending the early Protestant sectarian nature of the Carters Union. Tom Mann was later charged with sedition by the authorities the following year. Bilal acted as his legal counsel and by this time, Bilal had become well respected in socialist circles. And the truth is, as we mentioned at the beginning, the political status quo in the city itself remained largely un unchanged. And, la and Labour did not gain a real political f foothold in the city until after the Second World War. So what are some of the broader lessons that we as British Muslims might draw from this history? The first observation I have is that Abdullah Quilliam's service as a trade unionist did much to bring wider recognition and a measure of acceptance to the fledgling Liverpool Muslim community. I've not touched on it very much here but it's well known that in its early years in Brown Terrace, the Liverpool Muslim community faced open hostility uh, and even attacks on the mosque, attacks on Muslims going to and from the mosque um, were relatively common. So, 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 so Abdullah Quilliam working to get recognition for this community and a measure of acceptance was very important. And I would observe that this recognition and acceptance was the outcome of patient, long-standing and principled service for the whole community, for the benefit of the whole community of Liverpool, um, in this instance through trade unionism. And it should be said, careful networking with limited resources. The second main point I want to um, finish with and end here is that the Quilliam family, like any other family, was very much shaped by its local context. Um, quite often the focus on Quilliam has been with his transnational connections to the Ottomans and others. But I think, I hope I've shown here, it, it would be dangerous to ignore local context when it comes to understanding Quilliam's life. In the life of, of his family. In this particular example of trade unionism, when the Carters changed from a cautious Tory-led unionism to a more radical approach in the run-up to the First World War, Bilal abandoned the cautious approach of his father. 
So I would observe that the nature of public service changes over time, and we too have to be prepared to accept change as Aquiliums did here. For those of you who want to know more, there's some further reading here, and please click on the link below uh, in order to access um, the top article. All the references you, you could want, including to primary sources, are, are in this piece. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please, um, I look forward to any comments you want to write below, uh, any suggestions for other things that could be covered. And I hope to return uh, with, with another presentation uh, soon, sooner rather than later. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye and assalamu alaikum.